parents and guardians. So um, we are really excited to have you um, at this year's second uh, college admissions parent orientation. We have one back in September. So if you join us on that one, thank you for coming back. <laughs> um, we're gonna be sharing a lot of similar information uh, but we um, are really happy to have you here again if you join us last time in September of earlier this year. Um, so today we have um, a lot of information to share with all of you. I am Monica Cabrera. I am one of the CUSD Futurology counselors. The entire team of our four counselors from the district is here, as well as a special guest um, who we will introduce in just a little bit. But if you're here to learn more about how you can support your child's college and career readiness, um, you are in the right place. So, but before we get started, I do want to make sure that we um, get some information from all of you. So if you can do me just a tiny favor and complete this pre-survey, I'm also going to put it in the chat for you if that's easier. Let's see. We want to make sure that we are effectively delivering the information that we have for you all tonight. So if you can please fill out that survey, it would be great. It could give us a sense of whether we are, you know, for our efforts tonight are successful. So um, if you can all please let um, just fill that out for us really quickly. I did put that in the chat as well. So let's keep moving. I'll give you another few seconds to uh, scan that code or click on the link that's in the chat. Okay, let's keep it moving. Thank you all. Before we get started, I do want to give you a couple of reminders. So this is a webinar, so I cannot see or hear any of you. Um, you can only see our panelists and the, our colleagues who um, are in the background kind of answering your, your questions and checking in. Um, but all of that, your cameras and microphones are completely off. We ask that if you do have any questions to submit them in the Q&A. But we do also ask to hold on to your questions. We have a lot of information to share with you all tonight. And we wanna make sure we get through it all um, before we answer questions. But if you have a, a question, you can submit them in the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Um, if you see a little chain icon on um, your screen, that means that it's a linked resource. We are gonna be sharing the slides at the end. So you will have that, um, all of the, you'll be able to access all the links that we have on our presentation tonight. Um, and then I just wanna remind you all that this presentation will be recorded and it will be added to our YouTube channel. And there are 100, over a hundred presentations on there um, from you know, all the previous years that we've been doing this. So if you can please share, um, check out and um, our YouTube channel, cause we do have a lot more videos just like this one that are super helpful on there. Um, you can even subscribe so that you can see when we update and add new content on there. All right, so I want to kind of make sure that we um, it formally introduce ourselves. I did mention that I am one of the CUSD Futurology Counselors. This is our entire team. Um, we are the District College and Career Counseling Program. We are made up of credentialed school counselors. All of us are experienced college admissions readers. We have experience with, you know, reviewing applications and being on, having that experience on the back end after students submit college applications. We are data-driven. We're proud that, you know, we, we uh, all of our efforts are data-driven. So we make, to make sure that all of our, you know, our work is effective and it is meeting the needs of students. Um, the ways that we can, we support students is, Specifically, we're doing one-on-one -on -one individual counseling appointments. Uh, we also provide support in Spanish. I am uh, the bilingual counselor and I meet with families and um, students who need support in Spanish. Uh, we also do a lot of workshops and events on online, um, on your campuses. Um, and then we also provide school wide support. Um, we work with many of your school's um, counseling team, um, to make sure that we are providing a lot of support to students. All of our events, everything, presentations is completely free to CEOs, these students, because like we said, we are part of the district. Um, and then everything that we provide is also, we have a really robust website with a lot of resources um, and you know videos from previous presentations. So please check us out. This is our entire team. Um, uh, and yeah, okay, let's keep moving. I wanna make sure we, also cover who is presenting tonight. As I mentioned already, um, I am one of the CUSD 
speechology counselors, but joining um, who will be my co-presenters is B. B, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is B. I'm part of the Futurology team, a college and career counselor. So excited to be sharing some really important information with you tonight. This is one of my favorite things to talk about. Um, so we hope that you get a lot out of it. All right. And then we do have a special guest with us um, who uh, has been presenting with us, on, uh, doing this presentation with us. And it's always really fun to have her um, and to share her knowledge and expertise. So Brianne, if you want to introduce yourself. Yes, hello. Uh, I am so glad to be here. I am Brianne Boyle, and um, I am a college advisor with my own company, BB College Prep. I'm also the current president of the Western Association for College Admission Counseling, which we like to refer to as WACAC for short. Um, so I'm super happy to be here with you guys tonight. Thank you, B and Brianne. Um, so we hope that you all um, enjoy this presentation. I'm gonna go into what we're gonna be covering in tonight. So we are gonna start off with, why are we here? I will go into detail as to some of the things, why we decided to do this presentation, why we decided to have these conversation with our families, um, you know, starting from eighth grade, um, all the way through until graduation, right? We have these conversations very often. of like, how do I prepare as a parent? How do I support my child? So I'm gonna go into that and then, um, we're also going to be covering the college and career planning process, um, hopefully changing, a, changing um, some of that process uh, for many of you. Um, and then uh, uh, Brianne is going to cover admission state of the nation. So what is going on with admissions uh, nowadays? Um, it's always changing. And then um, B is going to co cover college fit factors. And then I'll come back and talk to you all about parent roles and how you as a parent can support, like I said earlier, your child's college and career readiness and planning. And then we'll also cover grade level action plans. Um, and then at the end, we will answer your questions. And I wanna remind you that if you see that little chain, we will, those are linked to resources um, that you can access later when we share the PDF of the presentation. And again, this is being recorded. All right, so let's start with a poll question. So I wanna make sure that we um, ask our, um, our parents, um, what is your child's grade level, your student's grade level? We wanna see who is joining us tonight. Okay, Most ju mostly juniors, but I see middle schools catching up, okay. Very good, I'm gonna close in just a few seconds. All right, five, four, three, two, and one. All right, I'm gonna end poll and share results with you all. So it looks like we have mostly middle school families, which is very interesting. Um, I'm glad you all are, you know, um, joining us early in the process of, you know, starting um, with your college and career planning, with helping your child's college and career planning. Um, it's really refreshing to see middle school families. We mostly work with high school families. So it's really great to have you all learn about our team and learn about this whole process very early on. And it just, it's really exciting to have all of you, of course. Um, but it, like I said, it's really refreshing to have um, majority of the representation be middle school families. Um, Second is going to be junior. So I, I also junior is a very important year. So I can understand why a lot of you are also, you know, on that grade level. But thank you all. Just one more question. It's for all of you. Give me just a second. One more question. So what are some of your concerns or anxiety surrounding your child's college and career planning? So let me launch that poll. So we understand there is a lot of things going on, right, with COVID and everything. Um, but if you can all just give us a sense of what are your, you know, your biggest concerns when it comes to having these conversations or planning for college and career. Yeah. Okay. I'm seeing admission requirements is a big one. Acceptance rates. Yeah. All valid concerns. Acceptance rates, yes. Okay, so I'm gonna give you five more seconds. Five, four, three, 
two, and one. All right, so I see the biggest one is admission requirements, right? Um, yeah, we get a lot of parents coming to us that, you know, what is, how do you apply? What are the requirements? And so I hope that tonight that gives you a, sense, a better sense and um, kind of alleviates some of those concerns. We also will, um, acceptance rates are really important too, right? That is a big concern. Um, and we have a lot of those conversations with our students as well and our families. Um, so, but again, all of these are very valid concerns and um, we get these questions all the time about all of the things that you, you know, all the answers that you saw on here um, on, on the poll. Um, so nothing is, <laughs> is out of, out of uh, you know, it's something that we don't cover. Um, it's just, it is a lot. So we understand that you have multiple concerns and um, all of these are valid. So thank you all again for, for doing that and sharing your, your, your concerns. So I wanna make sure, like I said, we, we cover like, why did we start doing this presentation? And I think I answered that earlier. And of course, with all the concerns that I saw in your responses um, just now, is we get a lot of parents and families coming in and they have this really big fear and anxiety. They feel like they're very behind. Um, they don't know where to start. Um, they feel like they need to be an expert. Um, and they feel like, you know, um, they can't help their child um, as much as they, they want to, right? So I just wanna say, you know, all that fear and anxiety is very normal, right? You, were, you, you went to college, if you did, you went to college years ago, right? So um, you aren't expected to have all this information, right? Like I said earlier, admissions does change. Um, so it, it is completely normal to have some fear and anxiety um, surrounding, you know, college and career planning for your child. Um, college admissions is getting more competitive, but I think Brianna is going to share some really great information to kind of address this, this fear that, you know, parents are, have this, um, you know, fear that it is getting more and more competitive. And then a lot of, um, you know, families um, and students and all of that, they, they believe that, you know, that the best college is going to equal success, right? There is a lot of misinformation and all of that. So we want to make sure that we address all of these and kind of turn them upside down so that we can go in into, you know, this planning with a better sense, you know, that you are, um, you don't have to be totally, completely like knowledgeable about all these things that you do have a lot of support system and that today you'll get a sense of how to start this whole process um, so that that fear and anxiety is not there. Um, so we hope that you learn more about, more about where to start, more about the process. That's why we do this presentation um, so that if you do ever also meet with us, you have a better sense of, you know, where you're starting um, rather than coming in, you know, with mis misinformation, misconceptions. Um, and also you feel more apt to provide more support to, to your child. Um, and also just to avoid becoming a, like what we call caregiver against virtually everything, right? That you kind of lead with misinformation, lead with that fear and anxiety. Um, we want to, we want parents to lead with, you know, with flexibility and under, and, and knowing what their limitations are as far as like knowing all these things and knowing who to go to for these answers, right? Um, so we want to make sure that we avoid becoming cave people that, you know, gives into that fear and anxiety and starts researching where, where it's not worth in a place where it's not reliable and um, you're not getting accurate information. So we want to make sure that we have this paradigm shift. Um, and as a parent, we hope that you have this paradigm shift and you acknowledge that, you know, you can, you can have, um, like I said, you're not, you're, you're not supposed to know everything, right? You can acknowledge that and um, have this, this process be student driven, right? Um, so you may lose some power, but not all the power, right? You may lose some power in that sense. So it is important to know what your limitations are and knowing who to go to when you need that information. Um, as a parent, I do hope that you all pledge and you can do it now. You can raise your hand and 
um, pledge that, you know, that you will resist, resist the urge to, you know, leave with that fear and anxiety. You will pledge to make informed decisions, right? To go to somebody who has, um, you know, the information that you're looking for, who can provide more information, who can provide more support for your child um, and know that you're not alone, right? That you are, you are um, there to support, but there is also more of a support system for your child to be making this college and career planning um, more productive and also more enjoyable. Um, so there, but also there is no manual, right? We all make mistakes um, when it comes to anything. So um, there, there really isn't a right or wrong way to do it. Um, so process, you know, all this information in bite-sized pieces. I know we're gonna be covering a lot tonight, um, but that's why we're recording it. So you can go back and review it later. We're gonna be sharing the slides so you can go back and review this once again. But that's the pledge that I hope that you all take in tonight as we move into going through what, how to start um, this whole process. All right. Well, speaking of the process, I do wanna, I'm gonna go into what that process looks like. But before I do that, I wanna make sure that we cover what the typical college decision model is. Um, so typically when we meet with most parents, right? Um, and students is, you know, they, are, they, they come in and they have in mind, you know, what, what college they, they're, you know, they're, the students usually have an idea what college they want to go into. Um, and all of this is mostly informed, you know, by their friends, maybe parents, family, um, sometimes TV, sometimes the internet, right? So they have this idea, you know, I do want to go to this specific school. Um, and then everything else will just fall in line, right? Major, career. Um, and that's typically what we see with families. And um, what we want to do, and we want to encourage our students and families to have a paradigm shift where they're making their decision based on their best fit, the best fit in terms of what is it that they are actually interested in, what is their personality. So in that, we want them to start off with knowing the students, knowing who they are, what their strengths are, what their skills are, what their life goals are and going into this whole process where they're doing things. And then the third thing will be actually looking at colleges. And I'll go into a little bit more detail of what this process looks like, but we wanna flip the college decision-making model into the first step we should encourage our students to start with is learning more about themselves, learning about what are they likes, what are they interested in? Um, what is their personality? What are their skills? What are their strengths? And use that to inform what careers are going to be good for them, right? And that orange box, right? That orange box is going to be, you know, based on those, those things, their interests, their skills, their personality, what are some majors? What are some careers that are a good fit for them? And then we can talk about college um, and then we can talk about where can they prepare for those careers? Where can they find that major um, and then lead to that career? Um, and so we believe that by following this process, because it's informed by, you know, the students at the foundation, it is the students likes, interests, personality, skills. We believe that will lead to more success, more happiness in their career. So that's the the paradigm shift we want our, our, our families and our students to have is to base that, those decisions based on the students' likes, right? Remember, this is a student-driven, um, we want this to be a student-driven kind of process um, because it, essentially it is going to be something that is going to affect mostly the student, right? So in that first step, right, the initial step, um, is going to be that self-awareness, as I mentioned. The student needs to learn what are they, what are their interests, what are their strengths, and this could start as early as eighth grade, even earlier probably. Um, but they need to do an evaluation of their interests and their skills. They can do that doing a career assessment like the Holland Code, which you see is that's the image. Um, but essentially, that's what they'll they're, they're doing in that first piece is learning more about themselves. Okay. In the second step, 
it's going to be career exploration. So based on, you know, all their interests and their likes, what are careers that are a good match for them? Um, and this, if we added a grade level there, this as is kind of as they're going through through high school, right? If they started this in eighth grade, then this ninth grade, they can start doing more career exploration. Um, so in career exploration, they can explore in multiple ways. One of them is, you know, doing research and learning more through information interviews, uh, volunteer experiences, internship, taking some classes, joining some clubs, organizations. Um, but they can also explore academically, right, with some classes, right? I know B is going to cover a little bit more on, uh, on this um, a little bit later, but they can also explore academically um, with electives, with taking a community college course, taking a career technical education course or CCA courses, as they call them at our district. So there is a lot of ways that students can start exploring careers um, so that they can figure out what major in training they will need to complete uh, in order to pursue that career. So, and again, this can happen as they're moving through high school, mainly major um, exploration is going to be in 10th and 11th grade, but they need to determine what are the next steps for them to pursue that career that was a good match for them based on their interests and um, personality and all of that. So after figuring all that out, that's when we can start having the conversation about what is the best way college, what college is going to prepare them, or what pathway will they pursue? Is it an alternative pathway? Like, is it going to a fire academy? Is it going to um, doing like uh, going to electrician um, pathway, right, where they don't need to necessarily go to a four-year college? Um, and so that's something that they need to figure out with the best fit college. Um, research is very necessary. And as you can see, this conversation comes in in 11th and 12th grade. So we wanted to give you some resources on here on um, starting this whole process, right? So these resources will help you with starting with that first step in the career exploration or the college uh, uh, exploration um, uh, process, right? The college and career exploration process. So these are some uh, resources that you can, you can start doing that first step. Um, and then we have a few other workshops that we will be sharing at the end of um, for our ninth, 10th and 11th graders that they can use as well to start this whole process. So um, with that being said, I think I'm going to pass it on to my um, our special guest, Brianne Boyle, so she can give you all a college admission state of the nation. Hello. Uh, all right. So now we are going to dig into um, where, what is the world like right now in college admissions, especially with all of the changes. So um, we'll jump in here and show you some of the percentages of, of admissions here. Um, I have this cool little pie chart. So um, please don't assess the actual math. It is not based on um, correct math, but it's here to show you that most of the colleges in that little blue part of the pie chart is they're accepting at least half of the students that are applying. In fact, I would say more than half of the colleges that exist in the country right now, four-year schools, um, are admitting about around 67 to 75% of students who apply. So most of the students who apply to colleges are getting in to most of the colleges out there. When you look at that little green part of the pie chart, uh, we're talking about some colleges that are a little bit more selective. So anything that any school that admits fewer than 50% of their applicants would be considered selective, right? Because you only have, you have less than half, you know, of a chance to get in. You have less than 50% of a chance to get in. So that's enough to be considered a selective school. And then schools that are less than 20% of an admit rate would be um, what I would refer to as highly selective colleges. So to give you some comparison, in that green part where it says 30 to 40% of applicants are admitted, um, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo falls into that category. They're around a 30 to a 34% admit rate. Um, so, and then San Diego State, I believe also falls pretty close to that. Um, they might be just over 40%, I think. Um, and when we're looking at that red sliver, schools that people are familiar with around here, uh, UCLA is just at about a 10% admit rate in the last cycle. We won't see what they're doing this year until they usually release those numbers in the, the following fall. Um, but last year they were closer to 10% because their um, application numbers went up because of test optional, which I'll talk about in a minute. 
Um, USC is also um, hovering somewhere around, I think, a 10 to 11 percent admit rate, and Berkeley is pretty close. So those are just some schools we talk about, and I think sometimes people don't realize. They say, yes, we know UCLA is competitive, but they might not understand that it's actually considered one of the most selective schools in the country at this point. Um, UCLA actually gets more applications than any other four-year school in the world. So fun little fact for you. Um, but the point is, is that this is good news. So let's go to the next one. It's good stuff. Most colleges are accepting most students. As long as you don't only apply to, you know, those 20 to 30 schools that are hitting in that sort of, you know, highly selective range. And then probably that next category, if you include all of those, you're looking at about 100 schools. But there's around 2,500 schools in the country. So you have many options um, to look at. Um, so we're looking at like 40 or highly selective or so that are doing that less than, you know, 10% or under 20% of their applicants. So the main thing is to really look at a balanced college list. Make sure you're not only applying to the schools that admit fewer than 20% of their applicants. That's not really a smart bet, right? I mean, if you were going to go place a bet on something, you wouldn't only bet on something that you weren't going to win, right? So you would you would be smart. You would put bets on things that are across the board. Um, and also know that there is no data supporting that where you go to school is directly reflective of your success. So there has been many studies about that. And there isn't any data that supports that if you go to a college that is more famous or has a fancier name or is more is more difficult to get into, that it correlates to making more money or being more successful later. I can promise you if that data did exist, that is all those colleges would talk about. Um, there is good data about the fact that if you go to a college that's a good fit for you, you do tend to have more successes and more opportunities. So let's talk about what that even means. What happens then uh, when we go into what our colleges are looking for? So what, what are we looking for when we're actually applying? What do colleges want you to show them? What do they care most about? So I think we'll pop up some options here um, and then we'll let you take a little gander at what do you think is the most important thing out of these options. So you should see a poll. So we'll give you a couple of seconds here to answer. So just pick, we'll, we'll share, don't worry about it, don't be shy. Just pick what you think is the most important and we'll go ahead and end it in three, two, one. And then I think we can share results. Okay. Oh, look at, ooh, people have been paying attention. All right. So you can see we most people think grades um, followed by activities and demonstrated interest um, and uh, some of those and test scores in there. But I, I, you guys are getting smart because test scores being optional aren't as big of a deal. So we can go ahead and pop up the answers on the slides. So those are the options. And then you'll see the numbers show up. So um, go ahead and throw all the numbers up there and I'll just talk through all of them. Uh, might be good for you guys to see them all in context with each other. All right, so you'll see the first ones that are, are really ranked differently from the others. So we have classes. Really what that means is course rigor. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, but classes that your student takes, those are the things that colleges care most about. What classes are your student taking? Are they challenging themselves? Then grades matter. And grades are specific to um, what they care about as opposed to GPA. GPA is important in essence because they use it as a, as a way to kind of figure out where your student is, but colleges often recalculate GPAs in different ways. So the GPA that shows up on a transcript from your high school might not actually be the GPA the school, the college itself uses. So that's why we talk about classes and grades. So the A's and the B's and the C's, all of those things are more measurable against each other versus a GPA. Um, and then test scores will come into play after that, again, if they're looking at them. And then rank if your school ranks. So some um, schools, I believe this district does do a decile ranking. So that's just so colleges can see where does the student fall in line with other students in their class. It's not super important for them. It just gives a college a good gauge um, to compare, but it's not something that they're gonna use over other things. And then all those other little things, essays, demonstrated interest, recommendations, activities, interviews, all of those come into play in different ways. Um, because they can vary depending on the school, depending on the district, and depending on what the college is actually asking for. So that's why those are all sort of in the same thing, because that's more personal stuff, and those things aren't necessarily more important than each other, and not every student will have access to all of them. 
Um, so that's why we put those together. So let's head to the next one. And we'll chat a little bit more in detail about this. So what does it mean when colleges say holistic review? Um, I know you guys hear this a lot and it's kind of a, a fancy word and it's, you know, people talk about, oh, it's a holistic review. You know, colleges are, are looking at, at you in that way. And colleges like to say it too. Oh, it's a holistic review. It's a holistic review. So what, what even is that? Um, that means that colleges are looking at all of these different things. They're taking them all into context. So examples of those colleges are UCs, USC, University of Washington, Ohio State, TCU, Duke. I'll, I'm just throwing some out there. It's, it's most of the colleges that you're probably familiar with are using some kind of comprehensive or holistic review. And it means they care about the academic portion of the student, you know, that side, the classes and all of that. And they also care about these other extracurricular things, the essays and the letters of recommendation. Some schools do just an academic uh, review or they use an eligibility index, which is just using grades and standardized tests if they use those. Um, and they also might look at things like course rigor or how many um, courses you take in a certain category. Um, so those things would be all they would look at. And there's no, it doesn't mean that one is better than the other. It's just some schools will view them slightly different. So um, again, holistic review, some of the examples would be um, UCs, colleges um, that are looking for extra other things. Um, and the Cal States use just the eligibility and the academic side of it. So Cal States actually look at just the grades and the classes and that they're viewing just that on the student, whereas the UCs are gonna have more of a holistic review. So those are a good thing to, good a good example to compare to each other, um, but every school is gonna be a little bit different from another. So let's just chat about some academics. The good exciting part. Uh, so what I mentioned before, the classes that you take, uh, that's another, another term that colleges use is course rigor. So what classes is your student taking to challenge themselves? And everybody will be different. So that could be taking three or four years of a language and pushing this, you know, pushing yourself to take those kinds of classes. For other students, it might be, you know, taking an AP in one of the subjects that they're really good at. Maybe that means an AP chemistry because they love it. Or maybe that means AP art history because they're really good at the art side and that's a subject they really like. So I tell students that they should challenge themselves in, the, in their strengths before other things. So if you are really great at English, try taking the honors English or an AP English and see how you do. You know, your first year in high school in ninth grade, it's a good chance, it's a good time to try out maybe an honors class and see how you handle it. Um, and not every student needs to take honors and APs. I work with plenty of students who don't take honors and APs and they get into colleges. So this is not, and colleges you have heard of before you start, <laughs> thinking it's not colleges and they get into all kinds of places so it depends on the student itself it would be better for that student to take classes that they enjoy and they're going to do well in than for them to take super hard classes and really struggle that's not you're not setting them up um, for success that way they're not learning as much um, and you're not they're not learning how to manage their time and their workload so um, push them where they can a little bit and then let them explore things so um, that course rigor and then the grades are all a part of that. Love of learning is, it comes out in all of that. If you're taking some classes in subjects that you're excited about, you know, if you take an extra fourth year of a science or something and you don't have to do that, I mean, that's showing a love of learning right there, right? Like, oh, I've always wanted to take AP computer science. I'm going to go ahead and take that at my school because I'm interested in learning that. Maybe you take a school at a local community college or a career technical education type course. You have so many options through your district that you can take that will show that love of learning. Um, it doesn't have to necessarily be directly through your high school. Um, let me uh, mention that your senior grades do count. <laughs> Colleges will see those eventually. Uh, you might apply before you have final senior grades, but that is something that colleges will see. So you can't apply, get in somewhere, and then think you can just skate on through and get bad grades. Um, so remember that that level of learning matters. Your A through G requirements are your are listed up there. So those are those categories you have to hit to graduate, but you can do more than the minimum requirement. So even though you're supposed to take two years of history, if you really like that, you can take a third year or you can take a history every year, even though you only need two years of a lab science and three recommended and you love science, go ahead and take that fourth year of a science. Those are ways to show that level of learning. All right. I think I'm going to pass it on over to B for a minute here. 
literally just for a slide, everybody. So I'm popping in for a brief um, intermission here. Uh, Brianne mentioned love of, learn love of learning um, as she was talking about academics uh, just now, right? And I wanted to pop in to show you how your student can demonstrate a love of learning in school. Like Brianne said, taking an additional or year or two of science or a core subject that they like is a great way of doing that. But these are some other ways that you can do that in Capistrano Unified, right? As a high school student and as middle school students, you have the option of CTE lab. So we're going to talk about that. But you have options to demonstrate a love of a subject or a curiosity in a subject that you might like by taking classes. You can take electives in school, obviously, right? Electives are a great, great way to show that academic interest or that interest in a specific field or topic or subject. And you can do that in school. CCA courses, otherwise known as career technical education, which we will be talking about in depth this Wednesday um, in a webinar that we'll talk about later on tonight. Um, these are great courses for students to demonstrate a love of learning. If they're interested in health sciences, we have a ton of health sciences courses offered in school and after school for them. Um, you think of a career industry sector, there is something that we offer in line with that. This is not only good for demonstrating love of learning, it's also really great for career exploration because we're about both. It's not just about college, it's about students discovering what they're good at, what they might enjoy. And this is how we do it, right? So CCA courses are a great A through G approved rigorous way of doing that. And finally, community colleges um, offer courses for high school students. In fact, high school students can take any course at a community college for free um, through the K through 12 concurrent enrollment process. Um, so consider that when you feel that they are ready, right? Have that conversation with them. Another way to demonstrate a love of learning, to go above and beyond, or to just explore. And college courses are automatically weighted uh, in their UC and Cal State GPA. It's just a great way for them to explore something that they might not have access to in school. So just something to think about um, and consider as your students are moving you know, into the next grade level. And for those of you in middle school, please consider taking um, a CTE investigation lab at your school. Brianne, back to you. All right, it's popping back in here. Thank you. That's so much more detail about that stuff that I would not be an expert in. So let's chat about activities. <laughs> so the other things, other than all of that academic stuff that we talked about, all that is one bucket. And for those schools that are doing that holistic review, they are going to look at the academic bucket and they're going to look at personal bucket. The schools that do that more eligibility index, some of them won't even ask about these things like activities. Does that mean that you should say, Brianne told me I don't have to do activities and good to go. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is you might eventually create a college list and notice that certain ones will ask certain things on applications and some won't. Um, it's very easy to see which ones don't ask for anything other than academics because they will not ask you for an essay or any activities listed. Um, but I would say even some of the schools that used to be mostly based on academics, some of them even ask a few basic questions about activities, or they might ask you about activities for scholarship applications if you apply to those schools. So don't think that you shouldn't do these things. Um, it's just that they might ask about them in different ways. So don't be a joiner. Don't just join things to join things. Colleges are looking for students to not only show passion in activity or in academics, but also in activities. So do the things you want to do. Um, students should pursue things that they're excited about, things that they actually want to uh, continue to do. I can tell you it's so easy for me when I'm, you know, talking with a student about activities and they tell me, well, I did this thing and I go, oh, that's so exciting. How, so tell me about it. How often did you do it? How, you know, what's your, what's your involvement? And they say, well, I went, I went twice and I spent an hour doing whatever it is, a blood drive or something. And you know, that's not something a student's passionate about. And I think it's obvious. And I think it's fine to take your kids to those little things and have them try things, have them try it out. But if it's not something that they actively want to do and they're going to be excited about, colleges can tell that. So you want it to be something that they can get, invest that time and that effort. Um, hobbies count for that as well. They used to use a term, even when I was applying to colleges, which was many, 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 many years ago, about well-rounded. They wanted students who did lots of things, but that has morphed and changed um, and so I refer to it as pointy kids. They're looking for kids that show a passion in something and go deep into that. So if you love soccer, if you're super into that, maybe you're also 
volunteering to set up the practice fields for the little kids soccer tournaments. Maybe you're also doing some coaching on the side. I have a student who loves sports and she started doing some coaching as a small business and it actually started growing and she has several other students she does that with. Um, and that's just something she did because she just loved it. She loved her sport and wanted to do more of it. So now she coaches little, little itty bitty kids. And that's something that's showing that passion. And it can be a hobby. It can be, um, it can be doing things. I've had students who've loved sewing and during the pandemic, it was so hard to do things. So they started sewing masks, right? Um, you've probably heard that example now many times in the last few years, but it can be small things that a student just really loves to do. No, one activity is better. You don't have to do community service for a certain number of hours. Colleges aren't gonna say, oh, you didn't do X number of community service hours. Well, then we're not ad admitting you. There's, there's not a specific box you have to fill, but your descriptions of those activities and the essays you write about your favorite activities that those colleges will ask will be very clear whether that student did something that they really enjoyed or whether it was something they just did to check off a box. So be creative. Remember, it can be things outside of school that also count, jobs, hobbies, all of that. All right, so then let's uh, talk about the topic of essays. Always um, uh, a topic that never induces any kind of stress. But essays will be something that will come up, often referred to as personal statements. The colleges use these to get to know you better. So they want to say, okay, great, we know who you are as a student in the classroom, and we're you know, hearing about that from your letters of recommendation and all these things. We see these activities you do. Now just tell us something that we don't know. Um, and so here's some tips that you should use. You know, don't try to impress. If you are only talking about the you know, top most amazing things that you think you've ever done, you're gonna sound like everybody else in their essays because everybody's gonna try to default to that. It's natural, you know? You spent four years in high school trying to impress the colleges. And now I'm telling you, try not to impress them. But this is where they get to see who you are as a person. So make sure that that story is your own story. You're not just repeating information they can already see. If they see that you've been on the football team for four years, that doesn't mean that's a bad topic, but make sure you share some personal details about that that activity. You can totally talk about your sport in an activity or in an essay, but just make sure they're learning more about you. What are the things you loved about it? What were the things you got to do that challenged you? What was your team um, tradition on the way to games or something, you know, things that make it more personal. I will tell you, I have a list of some of the topics of some of the best essays that I have read in, gosh, I've been doing this for about 11 years now. And the topics are going to sound wacky. And this is why I'm going to share them with you because they sound like they would be terrible, terrible topics, but what they did is they all shared something about that student that was personal and something that I didn't even know about that student, even though I had been working with them for a few years. So some of the topics include someone wrote about being a good hugger. Um, someone else wrote an essay about macaroni and cheese. Another one about a lemonade stand. Another one wrote about making a homecoming float. Uh, another one that stuck out to me was a student who wrote about their job working at a boba store. Um, so remember that these can be about any topic, really. It's just for them to get to know who you are so that they feel a connection to you. All right, so let's talk about test scores. I know that's a topic that everybody wants to get into. So um, what I can tell you about super selective schools is that they, these test scores aren't going to help you get into colleges, but they can help you help keep you out. So, so let me clarify that. Let's say you have a 1500 on the SAT, top score is a 1600. 1500 still puts you in the top, top, top one or 2%. Um, that's a score that might help you get into University of Utah and University of Washington and many, many other colleges, most of the colleges that you might look at. But it's not a special score at Stanford. So while a 1500 might help you at some schools, when you're talking about the super, super selective colleges, a top score isn't going to be special to them. So, but a lower score is going to stand out to them. So a top score isn't gonna necessarily help you get into a school, but if you're not sitting in those score ranges for schools that are requiring scores, or if you're tending to send them, it's going to help close the door. Um, and this is actually a great way to consider whether or not you should be test optional, whether or not you should send a score. If it's not hitting in that middle range or where they're accepting at a college, that's a good reason to not send a test score. So just make sure you're prepared. Um, there's lots of ways to prep for the SAT and ACT. Um, both of those tests are pretty similar at this point. A good way to um, decide whether you're, which one you should do is Futurology offers lots of um, free 
diagnostic tests. So you can take ACT or SAT. They have it on their website of different dates. Um, go take one of each and see which one you're better at, compare your scores, and then decide if you want to do any prepping or review. Um, and then just make sure you know which tests are required at each school. Some colleges want you to report your IB or AP exams. Um, some schools are still asking for SAT and ACT, although there are very few. Um, and then it's good to know the average scores so you can make that determination. So let's get into test optional, which is, I think um, this is the meat of testing at this point. So what that means is the test optional term literally means you can send or report your SAT or ACT if you choose. You do not have to. Colleges will ask you on the application if you are doing this. Um, so one thing to note is to pay attention to that when you are in the application process. If they ask you on their application, are you submitting an SAT or ACT and you choose one of the options, if you submit your application in that way, not there are some schools that won't let you change that later. So just make sure you know what you are doing moving forward and talk to you know, your counselors at Futurology and make sure you understand what you should be doing about that. Um, but that means that they will not hold it against you if you don't send it in. They will just review all the other lovely stuff they know about you. Test blind or test free means that colleges will not look at your test score, even if you try to send it. So examples of this would be the UCs. Um, they are currently test free until the end of time at this point. Um, so even if you really, really wanted to send an ACT score to them, uh, they will not even look at it. So you will be wasting your money at this point. They look at all the other things that you send to them instead. The um, Cal States at this point, uh, they are voting, I believe, next month on whether or not they will be recommending to remove the test requirement. So we can update you as we get that information. The Cal States often follow what the UCs do. So I would not be surprised if they remove that requirement. Um, but as of now, they have not stated for this upcoming um, application cycle. So you can check at fairtest.org. They do keep track of the schools that are test optional. As of right now, there's over 1,400 schools. Before COVID, there were about 800 schools. So you can see that this has you know, pretty much almost doubled um, just in that time frame. And during the height of COVID, so 2020, 2021, there was over 1,800 schools. So I think you'll see that most colleges are heading this direction. So one thing to pay attention to on whether or not you send your score is um, to think about whether your score is additive to your profile. If we look at all of your academic profile, if your test score looks like it's about even or above kind of your GPA and sort of where you are academically, then it might be worth sending it to a school that is test optional. If your score is a little bit below your academic profile, then it's something that you might want to hold back. And just to assuage your fears, the SAT and ACT are not a measure of intelligence or how well you do in school or how successful you will be. It is literally a measure of how good you are at taking the SAT or the ACT. So um, please understand that this is a great movement for students to have more options that are test optional. And in case you weren't done with testing, here's more. <laughs> so as you're thinking about what you should take, um, I've mentioned taking diagnostic tests, which is really just a version of taking a free full SAT and a full ACT. So sign up um, through the Futurology website, uh, and then look at that and you can compare There's all kinds of concordance tables online. I think you guys do it um, with Rev Prep, I believe, but it, they, they'll give you some information to let you know which, which score is stronger. Um, and then find out if that score is going to add value so you can decide whether or not you can um, or you should be sending them. And then you can decide whether or not you want to prep and how much you want to prep. Um, test scores can help with merit money, which is scholarships just based on your grades and test scores. So there are some colleges that while they're test optional for admissions, in order to get certain scholarships, they might want a test score or in order to qualify for more scholarships, they might have a test score requirement or a kind of a line for that. So that's good information to look at with schools. So I think it'd be important to take a practice test, take a mock SAT or ACT, see where your strength is, and then you can compare it to some of these schools. And if you're starting to test close to where some of these scholarship lines might be, it might be worth putting in a little time to prep for those because you might get some more money on the back end from the scholarship side. So um, you can see the what I recommend there is, you know, if you are trying to get between um, 50 to 100 points more on an SAT or one to three points on an ACT, you know, that's something that you can probably do with um, a foundations course or something like that. Um, if you're only looking to do, um, you know, 50 points more on an SAT or one or two points in an ACT, you might be fine just getting a book and doing it on your own. Where you might want to look at tutoring is if you're trying 
I think move more than 150 points on the SAT and closer to four to six points on the ACT. That might take a little bit more um, detailed diving into the material for you. So I know that that was all the most exciting information you've ever heard <laughs> is SAT and ACT, but have no fear, there's more exciting stuff coming up. Thank you for that really smooth transition, Brianne. That was really nice. <laughs> I liked that. Um, better than the tried and true uh, with that, I'm going to pass it along to you. Thank you. All right, everybody, let's talk about college fit factors, right? We think, I think Brianne gave an excellent foundation on the many different factors that college can look at as they are evaluating um, students, right, for college admissions. Um, so let's talk a little bit about fit factors and, and what it means to find a best fit college. For some of the younger families in here, this might feel a little bit far away, but this is great information just to have in the back of your mind. We have a lot of junior um, parents and guardians in here, so let's talk. So about 60, roughly 60% 60 of students graduate from college within six years. That's the national average per the National um, Student Clearinghouse, okay? So that means that 40% of students are not graduating from college within that time frame. That's kind of an alarming number, right? If you think about it. And we have to ask ourselves, you know, especially as counselors, why aren't the that 40, why aren't those 40% of students not graduating? What's going on that they're not completing their education? Um, and if we move on to the next slide, we can start dis the discussion about fit and how this plays into that graduation rate number. Fit matters absolutely when it comes to colleges. The reason that so many students don't graduate um, from college in this country is because there was a poor fit um, when it came to their decision-making process and choosing the college and attending that college ultimately. Um, this isn't their fault, right? We base our college uh, list-making decision on, like Monica mentioned earlier, just so many very kind of cursory surface um, factors. We're not really taking a deep dive to make sure that the colleges that your student is choosing is really aligning with what they need out of the school as a learner and as a person. So when we think about fit and fit factors, um, especially for our junior families in here who are in the process probably of thinking about making a college list possibly, is we want to think about these three factors that you see on the screen. Um, social fit, am I going to feel comfortable there? Am I going to want to live there for four years and want to stay there, make friends? Is it going to be an environment where I'm going to thrive? Social fit is very important to make sure that the student feels like they belong on campus. Secondly, financial fit is another uh, factor that we have to consider. Um, what is it going to cost? Can we make it work? as a family, or is the student willing to take out, you know, X amount of loans. But financial fit is one of the top reasons students don't graduate from college within six years in this country is because um, finances become an issue. And I know that that's one of your concerns the, based on the survey that we took earlier tonight, right? Is what is it gonna cost? So these are things that we want to evaluate upfront and early on. Um, so for middle through 11th grade families, all of you in here, um, this is a conversation that we can have sooner than later is talking about limitations and um, expectations and financing it all. That's okay to talk about it now because it's an important part of the conversation. Um, and then finally, academic fit. Am I going to learn well at this school? Does it align with what I need as a student? Does it have the majors that I want? Um, do I have a good chance of getting in? We're going to dive into this all in just a second. But before I move on, we are going to link to an article. Um, there's an image of it, the, a little um, summary uh, of this research, um, this white paper that came out of Challenge Success, which is a nonprofit coming out of Stanford, their um, graduate school of education. And what they found in their research was that the college ranking and the selectivity of a college does not equate to student success, as Brianne mentioned earlier. It doesn't equate to positive outcomes, right, or job satisfaction or well-being of students. That's just facts. Um, so the name brand of the school has nothing to do with the level of success and satisfaction that a student experiences after they graduate. What they did find is that the top factor in determining a student's level of engagement and success and happiness after college is their level of engagement at that college. And every college is going to provide 
uh, different opportunities for students to be engaged, but ultimately it's up to them to take advantage of those experiences. I mean, think about your experience if, if you went to college or in, in high school or wherever it is that you might have done, right? If you think back and you have fond memories of that experience, it's probably because you were involved to some degree. You had a good network of friends, you were maybe in a club, involved in student organizations, whatever it was, those fit factors were clicking, right? Socially, you felt like you belonged, you learned what you wanted to learn, and you had good memories of that experience. Um, and so in summary, that's kind of what the, the white paper discusses. So read that for fun. If you have the chance, we'll send you this after tonight. Uh, but moving on, let's just address these fit factors very briefly. Um, we This is obviously something that we can talk to you about in a one-on-one -on -one appointment, right? Especially for our juniors. Um, you know, so don't don't worry too much about the, the nitty gritty. We have an entire webinar on this topic alone that we can link to. But social fit is very important. Like I said, will I belong? Do I feel like this is an environment that is my people? You know, like, are your students going to go off and want to be there and not come home for summer? You know, um, that's how much we want them to feel comfortable. And that involves location. It includes the size of the school. Um, some of us prefer to be in a smaller environment and other, but others want to be you know, on a campus with 20, 30,000 students. It just depends on the student, right? Um, but all of these factors are part of that social fit component, right? Extracurricular activities, uh, diversity on campus, all men, all women, co-ed campuses, athletics, D1 sports. Some students really want school spirit. So we're looking for a school with a really great football team or a football team, right, that competes. Um, these are all valid reasons to want to go to a school and students get to be very picky when they're picking their list. This is a very important decision. And so they can be extremely picky about what they want so that they can find that perfect school for them. Um, and again, just some, some, different, um, some different factors to consider, right? As you're thinking about social fit, but the takeaway is think about what makes them tick and what makes them happy and find an environment that offers that for them, right? So moving on to the next slide, um, there's just a visual that I like to use that if you've ever attended any of our other events about college admissions you've seen before, um, but I show this to students and I ask them, you know, is you, as you look at these photos, is there one that resonates with you especially? Um, and students tend to have a pretty, you know, visceral reaction to this, and they tend to know exactly what they want, and they'll they'll choose their photo of choice. Um, but this is a great way of starting the conversation of social fit. These are all very different schools, right? Boise State um, in the upper right hand corner, a very popular school in our district, D1 football, school spirit to the max suburban setting, mid-size, or actually large, excuse me, a large institution with tens of thousands of students. Um, but this is where they're going to go for that school spirit and that Greek life and the sports culture. If your student's into that, you know, we're looking for a school like that. Compared to uh, image B, which is the University of Chicago, this is a mid-size university in a very urban setting in Southside Chicago, um, extremely academic. Uh, no sports that are like super worth mentioning. They're um, they're very academically focused. Um, their unofficial motto is University of Chicago, where fun goes to die. My husband went there, so I he told me that. But um, it's it's a different vibe, but it's great for those learners who are really um, dedicated to the academic pursuit component of college, right? And then finally, we have. Image C, which is Colgate University in New York. This is rural. We're in a small, tiny little rural college town. It's a super small campus. It's a liberal arts college, and that's got its own vibe. But this is a way to start that conversation with your child as you're thinking about this. And these are conversations that you can have very early on. Okay, so moving on to, to financial fit. Um, big concern for everybody, uh, understandably so, college is very expensive, so let's talk about this briefly, right? Um, when we look at the sticker price of the school and we go to their website and we see how much it costs or we Google it, we're like, oh my gosh, like what, $45,000 a year or $60,000 a year, whatever it is, it can be really intimidating because um, some families might think that they're just on the hook for all of it. Um, the sticker price is not usually what you'll end up paying, right? Because there will be some kind of financial aid offer for every family, and that could come in many different forms. It can be gift aid, like scholarships and grants um, based on merit, right? Or based on financial need. Um, it could also be in the form of loans, uh, federal loans, right? Subsidized and unsubsidized. 
And this is all stuff that um, will kind of shake out as you complete your FAFSA and submit that senior year. Um, but I'm going to go back to academics for a second and remind you that good grades equal money, right? Um, the more you focus on school students, if there are any in here, um, the more chances you're giving yourself for academic um, merit aid. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Use a net price calculator. Every college has one, um, and you can kind of determine on a very, very um, kind of cursory surface level what you might get from the school. That's a great way to um, to make a financial decision about whether to add a school on a college list. Be careful with early decision. That's when students apply to a school. And if they are accepted, they have essentially committed to that school. Um, early action is different. That's when you apply early and find out early. But early decision is really, um, that's that's pretty intense. Because if you do that and you get accepted, you're you're bound to that school. So you don't get to see any other financial aid offers. And you, know, you don't get to compare prices and shop around for other colleges if you get accepted. So be, be careful with that. We can talk more about that. If you have questions, email us. Um, but also consider the Saddleback Promise Program or any community college in California participates in the Promise Program essentially, and that's free tuition. It's free college for two years for any student. Saddleback has no financial uh, limitations or requirements for families. If you complete the FAFSA your senior year, that's a financial aid application or the California Dream Act, um, and apply to Saddleback or IBC or any local community college, it will be free for two years and that's a great way to save money because then they can transfer to the university of their choice and still kind of end up with that end goal of graduating from college x right um but that's financial fit in a nutshell so let's go ahead and move on uh i'm really trying to honor your time because i know we have about half an hour left and i, I want to give some space and time for monica um to to help us take it home so academic fit finally is the third fit factor, and that is will I learn well? This is really important. So many of you had questions about acceptance rates or um, what are my chances of getting in? How many colleges should I add to my list? So we're gonna talk about this and it all falls under that academic fit umbrella, okay? But academic fit is what it sounds like. It's do they offer the majors that I want, the programs that I want, and all of these other different little things to spice it up, right? Distinguished faculty, internship opportunities, job placement of graduates, graduation rate, retention rate. Graduation rate, again, on average in the country is about 60%. So if you're looking at colleges, I would wanna make sure their grad rate is somewhere near the average, right, of 60%. That's a good way to gauge a school. Retention rates is how many students are returning for their sophomore year of college national average is hovering around about 80 percent so 80 percent of students are returning to their college for a second year so if your school that you're looking at has a retention rate of about 80 percent or higher they're doing their job they're they're kind of on par with everybody else in the country i will definitely share resources of where you can find all of this information in just a second so don't worry about that but some academic fit fit factors to consider. Um, so a little bit more about academic fit on the next slide. Um, just remember this image for a second, right? This is a traffic light. Um, red light stop, yellow light slow down, and uh, green light go. So let's talk about what this means in the context of academic fit and something that we call credential matching. So if you're kind of off there getting a drink right now or not paying attention, I urge you to pay a little bit more attention because this is going to be um, one of the bit best ways and one of the kind of fastest ways that you and your child can determine where a college falls for them on this spectrum of likely target and reach, right? Where, where do I fall? What are my chances of getting in? Credential matching. How do my credentials align with the credentials of the average freshman getting into this institution? Um, this is where we start to do that math so that we make sure that your student has a well-balanced list, right? So if you see here, we have three categories, likely schools or schools that students have a very strong chance of getting into, right? And that's based off of, in the past, SAT, ACT scores, less so now, but can still definitely be used if they have it, um, GPA, right? And then, um, of course, most importantly, if you, uh, Monica, if you could give me three clicks, um, the acceptance rate of the school, right? I have an example student on the screen with a sample SAT of 1100, a sample GPA of a 3.5. So this student applied to likely target and reach university. And these are the ranges for those schools. If you look at likely university, their SAT range was 800 to 1080. Our sample student had an 1100. 
super awesome rock star above average. Um, likely university's essay or excuse me, GPA range was a 2.75 to a 3.3. And our student had a 3.5, again, above average. Great. Um, but the most telling piece of data that you can look at to determine if this is going to be a likely school is the acceptance rate of the school. When it comes down to um, or what it comes down to is the acceptance rate of the school oftentimes, and this school is very accepting 70% or higher and I would say that these numbers that you see on the screen are pretty applicable to most of the students in our district, everybody is different so we can't use this as like a blanket like this fits all, but this is this is a pretty good metric to use, right? This is a pretty good starting point for everybody to use, as likely as an acceptance rate of 70% or higher. Target, then we're looking at an acceptance rate of 40 to 70%. And that's, that number is gonna change depending on your student's GPA and their stats and the courses that they're taking. And that's some math that we can do with them or their counselor can do with them. Um, and then of course, reach schools, in my mind, is a school with an acceptance rate of 39% or lower. In my experience, um, it's going to be difficult for everybody to get in at that point, right? Highly selective at that point, or very selective at least. So keep this in mind. We'll, you'll have access to this um, specific slide when we send the presentation to you, um, but feel free to let us know if you have any questions as well. Let's go ahead and move on um, to talk about the ultimate goal. So a couple, uh, probably three clicks for me, Monica. Um, the ultimate goal for your student is for them to have a balanced college list for my junior families in here, this is this is explicitly targeted at you at this point, because this is your life right now right going into summer is I need a college list, and I want it to be balanced by summer by July, ideally. Um, so if we look at this, we want a couple reaches that's fine, because there will be schools out there that meet all of your fit factors every single one. Um, but they don't accept a lot of students, but you know what apply if it really does meet all of your fit factors there's no there's no one saying that you can't right so a couple reaches is cool we want the bulk of your list to fall into that target range where you have a strong chance of getting in and, and the odds are decent right in addition to that obviously they're going to meet social and financial fit factors as well um, and then finally a few safeties or likelies is always a great choice make sure that these likelies also fit all of your fit factors right we're not doing um, we're not adding these schools as backups. We want them on our list. They're exciting and we have a strong chance of getting in. That's all good to me. That sounds great to me, right? Um, so this is the kind of balance that we're talking about. And we will be offering workshops to juniors in the spring. Uh, and it'll be a two hour workshop on how to build a list and we'll walk them through um, the process. So moving on, um, I wanted to remind everybody in here that that can be a little anxiety inducing thinking about acceptance rates and you know one's odds of getting into a school. Um, but there are almost 4000 degree granting post secondary institutions in this country of those about 2600 are four year universities, so you have so many options and as Brianne mentioned earlier, the majority of them are accepting the majority of students who are applying right. Um, we tend to be very fixated on the top 50 top. 100 schools in the country, um, but there are so many that you don't even know about yet, and there are so many opportunities out there for your students, um, and we can certainly help them find those institutions that will really meet their needs. Um, if we move on to the next slide, we do link to some resources for you that you can look at with your student. These are great search engines to use. I love Big Future. I'm such a fan of College Board um, and their search engine, even though they changed it on me, I still like the new version, so that's good. But these are all great search engines for you to use to look at that data we were talking about. Acceptance rates, average SAT, ACT score of students getting in, average GPA, average rank, all sorts of stuff you can find out about schools from a reliable source, right? Monica mentioned um, doing your research using reliable data. This is where you can find some of that reliable data. Um, we don't want to be deep into Reddit. We don't want to be on College Confidential. We want to try to use sources that are pulling from uh, trusted data sources. Um, but moving on, I think I'm going to go ahead and pass this back to Monica, I believe, because we will be talking about your role um, in this entire process and in supporting your students. Thank you, Dee. Um, so I'm wrapping this up or almost wrapping it up because I do have quite a bit more information to share with all of you. Um, but what we want essentially um, for 
the parents that are joining us, the guardians family that is joining us tonight is to, again, I want to remind you of that pledge that we made at the beginning, right? That we hope that all this information is going to lead to you avoiding being, you know, kind of a helicopter parent. Remember, we want to give up a little bit of control because essentially this whole process is going to be student informed, student driven. We want to make sure that we have those conversations with students so that we avoid this kind of, you know, um, this dynamic of being, you know, what we call what you've heard being a helicopter parent. Um, and of course, you play a big role in this whole process. Um, it is really an important role uh, because you are going to be, sometimes you do have to lead those conversations, right? Sometimes you do have to start those conversations. So we want you to just remember that this is a team effort, uh, but also this is your child's journey, right? They're the ones that are going to be going to college. We want the best for them as counselors, right? We want the best for for your kids. So we want to make sure that it is student focus and remember that this is your child's journey. We want you to celebrate their strengths, right? It's hard. It's hard to sometimes when, you know, when you're, you know, when your child is struggling, whether it's academically or, you know, mentally or anything like that, but celebrate their strengths. Um, and also focus that it's it, uh, a focus on effort and strategy over the end result, right? So focus on the present, right? As I know, we um, are very future focused most of the time because we care about, we care about them. <laughs> so, uh, but just focus on, you know, what's going on with them now and having those conversations and learning more about where they are, they are at now um, so that we can focus on that effort um, rather than the end result or what's going to, you know, happen and all of that. Um, also, you know, have good expectations, right? Um, uh, about your, your child's, so about your child's planning with this whole thing, right? We want to make sure we go with that mindset that we are, there's so many options. Uh, there's, there really isn't, like I said, a manual to do all of this. So go in there with a good mindset when starting this process or continuing this process. Um, so those are just some things to remember, but specifically with college planning, B, did you want to say something? I did. I just wanted to, to add, but you were going to go on. So I, I hate to, to interrupt your flow, but um, one thing that I, I would, a piece of data that I would want to share is that research has shown that parent and guardian expectations that their student go off to pursue something after high school, whether that's post-secondary education, like college or training, that's the number one indicator that the student will then have that expectation for themselves. And so to have that expectation is a perfectly acceptable and healthy expectation to have is, hey, we want this for you. You know, we want you to go on and to learn more and to get the training that you need to do whatever it is that you want to do. That's considered a good expectation, but a bad expectation would be you need to get into UC Irvine, right? You need to go to San Diego State or it's you know, it's all or nothing. Um, so just a little kind of like context into like good versus bad expectations. Um, but the t my main point was that, you know, your expectations of them to pursue higher learning can really help motivate them as well. Yes, 100%. Thank you, B. Um, but just more tips and information for, for, um, for our families joining us. Communicate, right? Have those conversations. We've been saying it all along that it is a it is something that um, as a parent and a student, you all can, you know, can do this. You can practice more communication, um, define limits early, right? So um, going back to that good expectations and bad expectations conversation, right? We, um, as, um, as a parent, you also need to set a limit of, of, you know, that you can be having these conversations when they're appropriate, right? So define those limits a little bit early, um, plan financially, right? So we talked about, about this. These are also some things that you can start as early as middle school, having those um, conversations, not necessarily with the student, but having conversations with, you know, as a parent, what, um, what, is, what is the plan financially uh, for the future? Um, help brainstorm, right? Your child, help them, ask them about their interests are, um, ask them about their goals are for, the, you know, uh, for high school, for middle school, um, but don't take over that whole process. Partner with us, partner with the educate, other educators at your school, teachers, um, counselors, uh, administrators, um, with our futurology team. So partner with educators. We are a support system for your child. 
So, and we're also people that can help you find answers if you do have any questions. Um, and again, I want to remind you to get informed and use, using reliable data sources, the ones that we shared, and we're going to share a few more here. Um, so College Board, again, we love College Board. They have a great parent guide. So we'll, um, that's a linked resource that you'll get um, with the presentation. Um, there's other resources on here too. I know B loves the Sally Mae Paying for College resource. Um, it is really great. Um, so uh, again, we have a lot of resources for all of you to start um, learning more about how, how to uh, how support your child with this whole planning. All right, so let's get a specific, right? Let's get specific as far as what are grade level action plans and when most of these are gonna be, you know, student center, right? So what should your student do in middle school to prepare for college um, or prepare for careers? So um, bear that in mind as I go through each um, grade level action plan. So for middle schoolers, um, for middle school families that joining us, I know there was a lot of you in here. Um, so students should be building their study skills, right? They are going to be needing those a lot, especially as you know, transitioning from elementary to middle school, they're going to be having a lot more responsibilities, a lot more classes. So they should be working on, on their study skills and figuring out what is the best way for them to, to study. They also need to start learning, especially eighth graders going into high school, they need to start learning more about what are the A or G requirements, um, because those are going to be important starting from ninth grade and potentially, you know, um, even if uh, in middle school, if they take Spanish or, you know, algebra one, or a language other than English, not just Spanish. So it is something that they need to learn about. Um, you know, I would say eighth grade is a good time um, to start learning about those so that they can come ready um, when it comes to high school about those requirements. Um, and then we also encourage uh, to take challenging courses, right? So take that um, CTE <laughs> course um, that's offered at your school. I believe it's a lab course. Um, uh, to start preparing for high school because it is going to be a little bit more challenging. So we want to make sure that you start getting that practice. And then, of course, what's most important in my, you know, my opinion is to identify your interests. So what are some things that you're interested in um, so that, and, and start getting involved in exploring those interests, whether it's in your community, in your school, um, so that you can start early on um, with, you know, with exploring those develop academic goals, right? So as, as we want them to start learning on setting goals and specifically academic goals. So what kind of grades do you wanna see? Uh, what kind of, you know, things do you wanna learn? Um, so they need to start developing those goals in middle school or start learning how to develop goals in middle school. And then of course, do the best that um, students should be doing the best that they can in, in their classes um, so that they can start, you know, being successful in middle school. All right, moving into high school, ninth grade. Again, we're going to push that, um, that, that they should be developing their study skills, especially now that they're entering high school and classes are getting a little bit more challenging. Um, and they do start, you know, being more um, important in regards to colleges, um, college acceptances, right? Because those courses are going to be start being important uh, as part of the eligibility for admission. So it's important that students are, you know, building their study skills so that they can be successful in their classes. They need to start taking those A through G courses. They need to continue with that exploration, specifically with exploring careers, um, so that they can figure out what are some classes that I can take to explore this careers or this interest that I have. Um, they need to explore themselves, right? Um, so they need to do a little bit more self-reflection as to what are their what are their interests, what are their strengths, um, and they need to do the and to do this, they can pursue some hobbies, some of those interests throughout the year and even in the summer. And they need to start building a strong academic foundation, right? Um, so making sure that they're doing well in their classes, um, exploring, you know, potentially taking some uh, a little bit more rigorous courses the next year. Um, so that's why they need to build a build a strong academic foundation. Meet with us, right? So we do start meeting with students as early as ninth grade. Um, we do have a little bit of side note in terms of the requirements. Most students will we ask that they do career exploration before they do meet with us um, in the form of a, one of our really great workshops that it's called Eureka Career Exploration Workshop. So there's a little bit of a step. We start meeting with ninth graders in the spring of their ninth grade uh, year. 
Um, and then we also encourage our ninth graders to start planning for summer. Are you gonna take community college class? Anything else that you might wanna do during the summer? Moving on, so 10th grade, of course, a lot of the things are gonna be very similar, right? A through G courses, taking, but we are gonna be encouraging our students to consider taking more challenging courses like honors, AP classes, or advanced placement courses. Um, if, they, if they are struggling to get additional academic support, um, continue with the involvement and in exploring career majors, and then even consider taking a mock SAT or ACT, um, and also meet with us so that we can continue to support them individually, and again, plan for summer. 11th graders. Um, so as you can see, the list got a little bit longer. So uh, of course, they're going to continue completing those um, course requirements, um, the A through Gs, those are really big requirements for the UCs and the CALCs. Um, these are eligibility requirements. Um, for those, there are a set of courses. Um, so continue to do those throughout high school, um, continue challenging, taking challenging courses, um, consider taking one of those CTE, CCA classes that B spoke about, um, prepare for the ACT or SAT, of course, continue that exploration. Now we get into college exploration and building a college list. Um, again, meet with your college and career counselor. Um, and then uh, we're gonna into the summer, draft some college essays, and of course do some summer planning um, throughout the spring of your junior year. Finally, um, 12th grade, of course, A through G courses are still relevant. Remember your 12th grade year is still really important for admissions. Um, continue taking those challenging courses, maybe taking another CCA or CT slash CTE class. Um, and then, of course, you're going to be doing applications for college, applying for financial aid. Meet with us um, if, you know, if you need more support. Um, but we do offer a lot of support for our 12th graders throughout the fall of their senior year. But um, we're running out of time, so I'm going to skip this slide really quickly. But basically, this covers all the things that we encourage our students as far as like support and services as well that we provide. So we do a lot of the work with uh, a lot of these things that you see on, on the screen with our students. So we, freshman year, we help them with assessments, seniors we would help them with completing their applications. But these are some of the things, kind of like a quick checklist of things that they should be doing throughout high school, starting from freshman all the way to senior year. All right. So just regular action items, again, more tips for all of you. So meet with your counselor, not just us, right? So um, as a parent, make sure that you are considering your, your partners, right? So talk, have a conversation, email your counselors if you ever do have questions about your classes. You are in charge of making sure that, or the student um, and you are in charge of making sure that you're doing course and grades audit each semester, making sure that you're still completing those requirements, that you're still in good standing for being eligible for college admissions. Um, a course uh, throughout the years, even as early as eighth grade, attend those events like college fairs. We do a, an annual college fair every year in October. That's really big, that's really great. We have amazing college uh, reps come and uh, present on their schools. Um, and also keep track um, throughout high school, keep track of the uh, students, especially keep track of your activities and awards, because it is something that's going to be important for your applications. All right, so I believe um, I'm going to pass it on to B so she can just wrap it up in a nice bow. Okay, wrap it up. Um, how can we help? Um, this was a lot of information. Um, so how can our team help, right? Uh, support your child in their journey. Um, if we move to the next slide, just a little bit about our team. We are college and career counselors as Monica um, uh, mentioned at the very beginning of tonight. Uh, we provide personalized support to students uh, in Capistrano Unified. We are Kappa Unified School Counselors. We are all experienced school counselors and experienced college admissions readers. Um, most, most of us have experience with the UC admissions process and have worked for the UCs. As admissions reader, our counselor Erica um, has worked on the private liberal arts side of admissions. So we have a little bit of everything on our team. Uh, absolutely free. We are a public school program, so there's no cost to families at all. We are available for you in the evenings from 1 to 8 p.m. Uh, so that we can accommodate your work and school schedules. Uh, we are here uh, seeing students uh, throughout the school year from September through May. Uh, so you can expect to meet with us during that time and to attend 
all of our workshops and webinars and other events that we host as well. We're located at the Shops at Mission Viejo Mall. Uh, we have an office there currently, but we're also on site at some of the high schools that have college and career centers. Um, and hopefully we'll have open college and career centers at all high schools by next year. That's the goal. We have three open right now at Aliso, Capo Valley, and Dana Hills. Um, and we also meet with students online if that is your preference. Um, moving on to the next slide, this is a list of our upcoming events. We host a lot of uh, workshops, webinars, events for families. We want to support you in every facet of this journey, uh, and we want you to have the information that you need to make good decisions, right? Um, so this is just a list. I know it's a lot. Take a look at it later. Please, uh, if you could go to the next slide, Monica, visit our website. One event that I do want to note that's coming up very soon is this Wednesday for any younger families in here, I would say middle school through 10th grade, especially if you want to learn more about the career technical education offerings in our, our district and how important they can be in the process of discovery and in college admissions as well come to that event. Um, we will be highlighting Aliso Niguel High School and Tesoro High School's programs on Wednesday, and then um, other high schools subsequently every Wednesday thereafter. But please come to learn more about those uh, programs. CTE is very near and dear to my heart. That's where I started my career. Um, and I'm gonna geek out really hard on this stuff. So please join me. I'm gonna put our events page in the chat box for everybody, register for the event on Wednesday and next Wednesday and the Wednesday after. Um, but Follow us on social media for all of our most recent updates for all of you. Uh, check out our YouTube channel. We have over 100 videos on all sorts of topics. Uh, we have our entire college fair from this fall uh, on our YouTube. So you can watch every single section if you so um, desire. OK, so moving on um, to the next slide. This is our post survey. If you could do us um, a huge favor and complete this survey, we always want to make sure that what we're presenting to you is what you want to hear about and what you want to learn about. We're constantly trying to revise what we do to suit the needs of the district and of the families of this district. So your opinion is very important to us um, because we want to make sure that we're delivering to you what you need and what your child needs. Um, so if you could please scan this post survey and complete it for us, that will really help inform our work with the families of this district, which is the most important thing to us. So I'll leave this here for a second. Monica put it in the chat box for you as well. So thank you, Monica. So we can go ahead and move on. Um, the, the next resource is the parent folder. So this is all the resources that we wanted to share with you. If you scan this, um, you'll have access to the parent resources um, folder, which will include tonight's presentation. I just uploaded it in there so that you have access to the most recent deck. Um, so you can access all of those awesome linked resources and begin that journey of exploration uh, with your child. And with that, I want to thank everybody for being with us. Uh, we really, we really tried to get this in in an hour and a half, and we did. It's 7:27, so technically we're early, but we'll hang out for a little bit for about five minutes to answer some additional questions in the Q&A. Thank you so much for your time tonight on a Monday night, and we hope to support you down the line. Good luck to all of you. Have a wonderful week ahead. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Really lovely to have you all. You can stick around if you have questions. We're here to answer them. Pop them in the Q&A. But you're all free to go if you have no questions. Enjoy your Monday evening. And please reach out to Brianne as well. By the way, I included her email on, on the list. And Brianne is also going to be a resource to, he, to you as well. Um, but her email is on there as well, everybody. And thank you, Brianne, for being with us as always. Of course. Just speed talking through my slides for you. We're good. <laughs> Carolyn, your daughter is new to the district. Welcome to the district. Um, we're certainly happy that you're joining us and that you're new to the district. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you that our team is very unique, that no district that I have ever come across 
um, has ever had dedicated college and career counselors at the district level supporting families in this way. And we're extremely proud of the work that we do. And we really do try to support our students um, and supplement the amazing counseling that's being done on their school sites every day. Um, so we hope that you'll be happy with us and um, don't be shy, reach out to us if you ever have any questions. Yes, welcome to the district. Um, we got a great question. If um, you're if you're any juniors in here um, are registered for College List Jumpstart, um, you're welcome to have an appointment um, with us, but it, usually we recommend that you attend the workshops first and then come to a one-on-one -on -one appointment just so we can give you more individualized support. But usually those workshops are really helpful in answering most of your questions. So if after that you have more questions, join us certainly for a one-on-one -on -one appointment. But um, really excited, Kelly, for your, your son to join us for College List Jumpstart. It's a fun workshop. Yeah, I, I think that if he goes to the College List Jumpstart and then actually has a list, our meeting can be very fruitful right with him afterwards because then we can discuss the balance of the list if he has some kind of tentative list to go with um so it, it is always helpful to have that information so that we can have a more kind of in-depth conversation about the balance of this list and and any other questions that you might have We have a couple more minutes so feel free to to pop any questions that you have in the q a um, and we'd be happy to answer them. And if you don't have any questions, you're also welcome to log off as well. Thank you all. <laughs> Thanks, Kelly. Yes, thank you, Kelly. <laughs> Oh, yes, we can go back to the parent folder. I think um, that's what you're asking for. I can put the link in the chat again too for our parent folder. More specific uh, grade level checklists are on there. So those are always useful. Some more assessments, activities you can do with your child. So those are fun. So um, Anahita, you had a question about uh, recommending us recommending meeting with a high school counselor. Absolutely. Your counselor is there to support your student uh, in all facets of their academic college and career life, right? And so uh, definitely um, schedule an appointment to, to meet with the high school counselor. Students, all high school students will be meeting with their high school counselors to discuss their schedule for next year. So it's a great opportunity to discuss any questions that you might have. Um, great first step, absolutely. And just know that we're here to, to supplement if you have any other questions as it pertains to college and career. Oh, Jackie, Monica's responding to you. You asked what CCA classes are. Um, you should attend our, our CCA Pathways presentation this Wednesday. Um, we will be doing a deep, deep dive into what CCA is. It's Career Technical Education Opportunity <laughs> District. Career classes, basically. They're all A through G approved. Some of them are honors, mm -hmm. some of them are articulated community college classes, so you get college credit for them as well. Um, and we have all sorts of CCA classes during the bell schedule, after school, fashion design, fire science, EMT, uh, pharmacy clerk, hospitality careers, medical corps, medical hospital careers, aviation careers. Um, I could go on and on. There are so many classes for you to explore. Strongly recommend that you look into it um, and attend our event on Wednesday, and you can register for any events on our website here in the chat box. That's the link for our events page. So you can learn more about anything that we have coming up. But also, I'm going to put Just CCA's website in the, sorry, I'm yes. going to put CCA's website in the chat box for you too, so that you can look up CCA and learn more about them. Yes, if you do have questions about colleges out of state, that's something we can definitely cover during a one on one appointment. Um, if your child attends a high school that has a college and career center currently right because all the high schools are supposed to get one but Aliso Dana and um, Capitol Valley all have a college and career center you can stop there 
um, during lunch as well. I know Aliso and Capo Valley, uh, our counselors, or one of us is there on Tuesdays and Thursdays during lunch so they can stop by and ask really quick questions too. And then I'm at Dana on Wednesday through Friday so they can stop by during lunch too. Okay, everybody, last call for questions. We'll leave it open for another minute. Uh, thank you so much, Jackie. We yes, really appreciate you, you showing up for your student and you know trying to learn more about the process. That's definitely the first step. Thank you. All right, everybody. I think that's it for questions. We're gonna end it here. Um, but again, for those of you that are still here, thank you all for joining us. Like B said, for take, making time to preparing yourself and learning more about how to best support your child's college and career planning. We're happy to help, um, but have a great evening, everybody. Bye, everybody. Good night.